Hello, everybody. Come on in. Grab a virtual seat. It is so good to see everyone on on this beautiful Saturday. How's everybody doing? We're pumped. My name is Catherine. I'm a member of the Autocrit editing team and a longtime member coming up on six years of using Autocrit to edit my own books. And I've got Kevin on and Becca on in the background. Hey, Karen. Hey, Misha. Yeah, hey, everybody. We're going to be talking about planning and writing books today. And I am so excited because this has been something our team feels very personally. I don't know if anybody watched the YouTube uh, video that Daniel shared on the weekend or end of the week, really. It's the weekend now. Uh, but talking about how he is restarting a series that he started over 10 years ago, right? And picking that up. So we are right there with you here on our team, <laughs> planning and writing and editing. Finish bringing everyone in from the waiting room. Francis working on a new project. Hey, Sherry, Christina, Vance. Yes, hello, hello. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dive in because even though we have people joining, we're going to keep bringing them in. We're going to jump in. We've got a lot to cover and only an hour to cover it. We're all here to learn how to plan a book, how to write a book, how to pick up a book we started and, pick and keep going with it, right? So for those who haven't been in Autocrit in a while, I know I see some faces that I haven't seen in a long time. Hello. A lot has changed and for the better. There are a bunch of new tools that you can use Autocrit for to help you plan, draft, and self-edit, and now self-format your novel. And over the next six weeks, we're going to go step-by-step step through every single phase of that journey, from planning a draft for the first time to refining your editing process. So whether you've done this for 15 books, 150 books, or this is your first time looking at writing a book at all, hopefully there will be something here for you. There are no such things as stupid questions. So if you get going and you have a question, please drop it in the comments. We will be pausing to answer the questions that we don't already have built into the presentation along the way. So we're going to start with something fun. Wake us up a little bit here on this Saturday afternoon. If you have been around the writing community very long, you have probably heard these three terms, planners, plancers, and pantsers. <laughs> If you have not been around though, these terms refer to the way people like to plan and write their books. All three of these are very valid, good ways of writing your book, but knowing which way you fall will help determine the best means of going about writing, basically. Um, so our planners, I'm gonna let you shout out yourselves, my planners, if you are on and you already know. Planners, if you're sitting here with a note taking device of some kind or notepad and sticky notes for the notepad and numerous pencils, you are probably a planner. No. <laughs> uh, these are the people who go about writing, starting with an outline, very detailed. Usually all the beats are lined up and a beat is a plot point. They know what's going to happen in the beginning, the middle, the end of their story. You're here probably to figure out how to link all of that together and make sure you don't leave anything out. Plancers are people who like a little more flexibility. And sometimes, um, sometimes planters like to outline and just have a very loose outline for their major story beats. And then they pants everything else. They don't know what they're gonna do scene by scene. They just have the big key points. Sometimes planters start out pantsing and then they want to plan out elements of character development or world building so they plan a little bit and then they pants a lot then you have pantsers and my people i am pantser where are my pantsers at so we also sometimes call ourselves discovery riders i'm fine being a pantser i know i ride by the seat of my pants when I start a book in Autocrit, I don't know what I am writing, and I do not know where the book is going to end. I don't even know if it's going to be a happy ending or which genre it will end up in. I know it'll be fantasy. It'll be somewhere in fantasy, and that's about all that I know. <laughs> and we are going to be 
writing and don't run away because we're starting out with outlining tools. Because for pantsers, a lot of us are going to reverse outline at some point. We're still going to want to use these tools as part of our editing process. The order in which we use the tools is what's different, more so than having the tools available. Yeah, we've got people from all around the board here. We've got our planters on, our pantsers on. Great. And on the Autocrit team, we represent all three. Daniel, in case you didn't notice from the YouTube, is planner through and through. Becca is our resident planter, and I am, of course, a pantser. I don't know what Kevin would be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably on more of the planner side, even though I'd like to think I, I think, but I, I'm more effective when I plan. That's for sure. I, I just find that I get more done. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully if you're hearing it for the first time, you have an idea and you're like, oh, that sounds more like me and you can jump ship. We won't blame you. There's no judgment here. You can start out pantser and try planting a little bit and then go full planner if you want to. Um, Today, we're talking about planning and writing specifically. We will come back in the next few weeks with editing. For those who are asking about editing, we, we're going to get to you. Don't, don't worry. We got you covered. Uh, but we're going to start with some basic lingo today and walk through sort of what that is, where you're going to find tools to work with those things in Autocrit uh, real time. So the first thing is going to be the word draft. And draft is two things. It's a verb, meaning to write something out for the first time. And the second is the noun, my first draft. That means that first, what I affectionately call as a pantser, my garbage draft, the draft no other human being should see but myself, <laughs> is where you're going to just write, just get words on the page, just get the story down. That draft can then be polished up in post. Anything you do can be fixed in post during the revision and editing process. Today, we're going to learn how to draft, how to finish a draft we've walked away from, and how to flesh out um, an idea for one. And part of fleshing out that idea is keeping an outline. And today, you're going to see the term beat sheet and outline used sort of interchangeably because Autocrit's outlining tools make use of what we call beat sheets. A beat is a plot point in the story. And so every um, story follows a standard series of beats, usually, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, there are specific expectations readers have when they go in to pick up your book, right? There's going to be establishing who the character is, and then an inciting incident that starts them on their journey, and then things like that. So we've got drafting and outlining, and we have tools to help you with both. If you aren't using Autocrit for this yet, still take notes, because you're going to want to make sure you have um, these things in place when you go into this process. Well, let's get started on the brainstorming side before you put pen to paper, unless, as I said, my little pantsers, you have no idea where you're going and you're going to brainstorm along the way. We're going to open our planning process by figuring out what our story is about. What is our premise? There is a spot where you can brainstorm some premises. I'm going to pull that up in just a second in Autocrit. But it's fun to try to come up with your own. If you could summarize your story down into one or two sentences, not as a pitch, not to sell the book, not to send to an agent, this is just for you, and say, what do I want to have happen in this story? That is going to be the crux of what you build your story on, your cornerstone. So for example, this character, my main character, is living this life. And then something happens that adds pressure to that character that will start them on their journey. Then we're going to have a goal they have to achieve to either alleviate that pressure or overcome that pressure. And then we have the stakes for what happens if they fail. This is going to set up a good, strong premise for you starting out pretty much regardless of the genre. Even my nonfiction writers. If you are writing, for example, a memoir, your memoir needs to have a theme. It doesn't need to just be a disconnected random collection of stories, unless you're writing about somebody super, super famous that we're okay hearing a random collection of stories about. You're selling your genuine story, but it's going to follow a theme, love and loss, redemption, whatever that is. 
So you're still going to establish who are they following into the nonfiction story? What kind of pressure is that person going to be under? What is the primary goal that person's going to have? And what kind of stakes do they have if they fail? What I love about the nonfiction side, though, is because it's not fiction, we don't get to just hand these people a happy ending. So <laughs> they have their stakes and then we get to see what really happens, which adds a whole new level of tension there. So this is my MAPS acronym. <laughs> I can't spell speak today. Acronym. So main character, add pressure to the character, show your primary goal, and then go, go on to stakes. So as I said, in Autocrit, there is a place where you can see, I'm going to share my screen right here, in the writer's desk where you can go ahead and start planning all of this out, including that premise. So if you log into Autocrit, right here is the hub, and on the left-hand side is going to be your writer's desk. Or if you don't have a book of any kind yet, you can start your planning idea just right here. This very top option in story ideas and planning is new story builder idea. Before, because today we're gonna to talk about writing, I'm going to open a blank file, which is this middle option in the writer's desk. And I'm going to start a builder for an idea inside of this file. I'm doing that so that as I come up with ideas, if I have ideas for things I want to write, I can go ahead and write them in the file itself at the same time. So on the left hand side up here on this top toolbar where all of your editing and planning and formatting tools are is the planning tab. You can choose either a fiction or a nonfiction story builder idea here. We're going to do fiction today. If you started a builder outside of a document, that's fine. You can go ahead and find it and link it right here. But if you're starting a new one, like I talked about, you'll click new fiction story builder idea here. And the very first thing that pops up is your premise. What is the story going to be about? So you, this can be as vague or specific as you want during the brainstorming process, right? So you can start it off with Fred, a calico from the northeast side finds companionship with a field mouse. And what do I want from there? Where am I going to go? I don't know. Based on what I put in this premise, I can then go to the outline and beat sheet section of the builder and start having it brainstorm ideas for a story for me. Um, now, it's important to note that Autocrit is safely AI assisted. None of our tools will actually generate content for you. So if you put a premise there, it will not write you a book. You have to write the full book yourself, but it can help give you ideas of what if this is something that started? What if I wanted to take this and work it into my premise somehow? Opening my opening image in this beat for a plot-centered story then says, Fred, the calico cat is on the northeast side. It gives me an idea of the setting, gives an idea of meeting the mouse. And even if I don't want to use any of those points in the actual story, it gives me ideas for, hey, yeah, he does need to be doing something. He needs to be active in the beginning of my story. And he probably does need to be meeting the mouse there in that first chapter, right? In that first scene or two to set up the story. And so then I can build myself a little checklist of things I need to write out. And you can save these brainstorming ideas as a note by clicking this little yellow copy to note. You can adjust this any way you'd like. Say, oh, you know what? Um, I don't want them to meet in the fields. I want them to meet in a pizzeria. So prowling through a pizzeria. on the northeast side. Confused field mouse scurrying nervously among the kitchen utensils. <laughs> and here we have Ratatouille. So Ratatouille meets Tiger from Bible Goes West. I don't know. All right. So we can brainstorm right here starting with our premise, but all the suggestions that the builder is going to give me, if I click on any of these points, is going to be based on what I put in that 
premise box. Um, so the more specific you can be in this premise box, the closer aligned the results will be for what you might actually want for your story, right? So if I wanted this to be a story where the cat's living in a pizzeria, maybe I include that in my premise. Fred, a calico from the Northeast side, living in a pizzeria, stumble, stumbles across a lost field mouse who just wants to go home. And then Fred must decide to either help the mouse, even though it means leaving home for the first time, or eat the mouse, <laughs> like whatever the, the stakes need to be. Uh, if it wants to get rid of this mouse, he's going to have to help it leave and get home. Um, and then it's going to give me more detailed information and it'll build out on that. So we're going to take a couple minutes and think about our stories and think about how we would summarize what we want our books to be about. If you've already got one in the works, take a minute and think about that. It's going to give us about three minutes on the clock here, and we're just going to stop and brainstorm together. What kind of premise would you use for your story? And if you have no idea what you want to write about yet, you can take this out of story premise and generate something completely random right here. So I'm going to clear my builder out clear, and then run the story builder. And it'll give me random ideas. And I can just keep rerunning until I find one that, hey, yeah, maybe I'll start with that. Maybe I'll take an idea from this and start building out from that as I go, right? All right, I'm going to catch up with chats while you guys do that. And yes, thank you. There is a nonfiction version. So you can click over to nonfiction and there is a builder designed especially for nonfiction here. And instead of necessarily a premise per se, you would have a topic. What are you writing about? And you would use that to expand on your outline here, whether that's a persuasive outline or historical or informative. I love that dry erase board, Becca. What can I say? My creativity spreads all over the entire house. <laughs> now, if you are not already an Autocrit Pro member and you would like access to the Pro member perks that include these builders, we're going to drop a link for you in the chat. Uh, for 50% off your first month of a monthly pro membership. And you can come in and try everything that we're going to be showing today and over the next six weeks. If you're not using the Autocrit Builder, though, still try to keep notes of what's in here. because <laughs> That way you can be brainstorming what you need. You still need the premise. You have a concept outline, planning a beat wall and a full outline. That is committed, committed planner right there. Yes, so there will be recordings of the slides. If you go to the same link that you came to today, it will post there as soon as it finish process, finishes processing, which is usually just a couple hours, and then you can come back. And P was, oh, talking about on our mapping. He is your primary goal. What is it that they're wanting to achieve over the course of this book? Basically, what kind of journey are we signing up for with this character? Sounds <laughs> like critique partners without wine or coffee. Yes, no bribing. You have to bribe people and be like, hey, 
I had this brilliant idea. It's three in the morning. No, listen to me. Now you've got it right here in auto put. You can just throw it in there and then see, oh yeah, that was a good idea. <laughs> now you can work with it, right? Okay, so we're coming up on our three minutes here. If you would like to wrap up what you've got and then drop it here in the Zoom comments, we can look through some of those. Feel free to read each other's, to like the ones that you like, give a little constructive feedback, but remember that we're all humans here, okay? So, constructive and also kind. <laughs> Oh, got a great question. So none of Autocrit's tools are going to use your content in any way. We do not train our AI with your content. It is safely yours. And because of that, it falls safely into AI assisted since it's just giving you feedback. Um, and so on, I saw the question about Amazon. Amazon has two categories, AI assisted and AI generated. If you generate content, for your book in any way from having it write a sentence, having it write a paragraph, having it write a chapter, that's going to be generated content. And that's typically what requires the disclosure. Go look up though, the specific publisher or agent or retailer and see what they consider because everybody has different guidelines there. This is not really that much different than sending it to a human editor and having them be like, yeah, that's a sucky idea or that's a really good idea. Yeah, and here's some ideas. Or have you thought about them doing this or that, right? You wouldn't need to credit your Aunt Sue because she said there should be a, a romance between the football player that you were just going to have as a side character, right? It was just an idea. Okay. And Jeff? We have a whole session next week on dev editing that will touch on pieces you already have uh, written, but this works really good for works in progress too. You can pick up wherever you are, draft from scratch um, or come in later and even reverse outline, which is what I mentioned earlier. And that's something I do as a pantser is reverse outline very, very heavily in the system. Meaning I go in and take a completed book, run it through the analyzer that you'll see next week in dev editing, and then fill out my outline using that tool. I don't have to remember everything. And love this, Brenda. Okay, Brenda, that is a good segue while everybody's dropping their uh, premises in here. If you already have a story you're working, instead of starting a blank file, out here in Autocrit, you would click Upload File. And this tool allows you to drag and drop your file in docx, .txt, or .rtf formats. Um, it does need to be an unformatted plain text file. It should just be your text because you're coming in here to hopefully finish writing it and then edit it. And we have formatting tools that we'll get to later in the series to help you format it for publication. You can actually generate an EPUB out of here or a print-ready PDF out of here. Um, but for the sake of the editing and writing part, just a plain text file is fine. And if you're coming from something like Scrivener and you downloaded your work, when you click this window, you can select all the different files at one time and then drag them into here. And it will give you an option to either combine them into a single file or leave them separate. So you can go ahead and combine them all at once if you want to. All right, loving these premises. And we do have a lifetime membership. I don't know, Kevin, if you've got that handy, someone was asking if you don't wanna do a subscription base, there is a special running on lifetime right now, which is less than the cost of a year at the monthly rate. It's a big, big steal. <laughs> let me uh let me find that for you. Hold on. Yeah. I I started about 6 years ago in November and then came on monthly and then left for a little while and came monthly and then left for a little while and then when I came back it saved me so much time and fixed so many of my errors that I didn't have to have a line edit and I was able to just go to a copy edit and that line edit difference in cost was $1000. So it paid for itself in the first book. <laughs> 
And I was like, this is fantastic. And now I've written 10 books with it. So you you can do the math. That is $10,000. That's a very nice vacation. Awesome. All right. Great, great, great work, everybody on the premises here. Okay, so now that we've got our premise, we can move on in the brainstorming process and get to the good stuff, right? We know what our story is going to be about. So now we're going to talk about world building. Where does this story take place? There are two levels of world building that you need to think about as an author. And one is an immediate scene setting level. The other is a broad, big picture level. And think about the immediate level as being where the character physically is in that moment, in that scene, right? So this is going to be the cozy room. What do their senses tell them? That is what you're showing on the page. What does it smell like? What does it sound like? How many other people are around? What are people wearing? What are people doing? What kind of what time of day is it? What kind of activities going on around these people? So where are they? Are they inside? Outside? Is it clear on the page for your readers? And how does it sound, smell? Uh, if they're eating a dinner, how do things taste? What specific things are on the table? These little details come together to add immersion to your piece for your readers. And those two, um, I noticed we had some memoir authors in the chat. These pieces most commonly left out when you're writing a memoir. And it's because we take for granted that the things we are used to is they are things everybody else will have also experienced. We don't describe grandma's kitchen because we've seen it so many times that we don't think about the fact that nobody else has seen grandma's kitchen. Uh, so definitely make an effort on the nonfiction side too to think about giving readers a chance to visualize where your people are in your story. And then on the big picture level, these are things that uh, aren't necessarily described in the same level of detail as an immediate level, but they set the tone for the whole book. They're going to set the standards of the culture, um, any type of stereotypes that these characters, or if you write fantasy or sci-fi, are there races that have different stereotypes attached to them? Where are they located in their world? Is this a made up world? Is this somewhere in our world? Um, is this an alternate version of our world or our actual world? What kind of politics do they have? And how does the politics and the religion and the culture play a role in your character's lives, right? Um, if your character, for example, is a young, um, impoverished, teenager and their lot in life is to make a better life for themselves and to never be hungry again and never go through this again, they have a different outlook of the world. And because we're following them as the main character into the story, our outlook is tinted based on theirs. There might be better uh, people who are wealthier and they've just never met them, right? But they only know the one kind of person that they are encountering in that moment. Um, so look at the big picture, both from the narrator's point of view, if you're doing a third person narrator who isn't a character, and your main character's point of view. How are they affected by these things? And underneath the premise, the very first spot in that autocrit story builder is an entire section of all the things you can think about for world building. Animals, the plant life, all of those little details that we often leave out. Just think about them. And as they come up, jot them down and ask yourself the questions that your petulant toddler or your friend's toddler might ask you. Well, why? What are they eating? Does it taste good? What does it taste like? Go deeper. <laughs> Let yourself run away. Well, if they live in the forest, how do they have fires without burning the forest? Okay, well, that, that's a good question. How are we going to handle this, right? Um, I once wrote a book where the characters did not kill living things. So no plants and no animals of any kind for anything. And then one of my beta readers said, Catherine, then what in the world are they eating? <laughs> they can't eat plants and they can't eat animals. And so then I had to go in and work around. Well, does this mean, you know, that there's exceptions? <laughs> and 
that kind of aspect that really adds a lot to the world building. So just think about your world building. And then we're going to move into characters and we're actually about to pull Autocrit back up because there is a very robust character planning system in that story builder we were looking at. Most stories have a protagonist and then they have a group of side characters. Now, I did not include an antagonist on here because sometimes there is not an antagonist, depending on your genre. Sometimes the protagonist is their own antagonist, right? Um, but there is a place to plan out all these different kinds of characters. And the good news is Autocrit makes it so you don't have to remember what all of these roles are. It has a helpful little bubble next to every single one that you can hover over. We'll show that in a second. So when you're planning your protagonist or your main character, you need to keep in mind certain points from a developmental standpoint. You need to make sure that you're giving them a clear arc. Your character should not be the exact same at the end of the story as they are at the beginning of the story. Um, and by the story, I'm not talking about the ones that open with a vision of them in the future and then they flash back. Okay, talking about the them that started their journey. At the start of their journey, they were one way, and we are signing up to see how they grow, how they change, how they are challenged. So they should have a moment of either an overarch or an underarch. They're either going to start one place and get worse and then come back up and be a different person because of that experience, or they're going to start in the beginning and they're going to go over these trials, becoming a stronger version of themselves, and at the end, they've transformed in that way. Um, you can have roller coasters where they start out as arrogant and then they get worse and then they go up and they start growing into a stronger character and then they come back down. That's fine, any sort of this, but there should definitely be an established, here's who they were at the beginning. Here is who they are as the story goes along. Here is how they grow. And then here is who they are at the end. They should be the person who has the highest impact on your theme on your plot. The reason they are your protagonist is they are the person who affects the plot the most. I love bringing up Lord of the Rings, not only because I love it with a passion, but because it's a story with tons of main characters, a lot of whom get major POV page time, point of view page time, without being a main, the actual main character of the book. They are still in the end, in the grand scheme of things, the side characters to Frodo Baggins' story. Because what Frodo is doing, dropping that ring in the fires of Mount Doom, and Mor Mount Doom in Mordor, determines whether anything that anybody else has done even matters at all. If he the fires of Mount Doom, none of the stuff of uniting Rohan and Gondor matters. None of the stuff with Wormtongue and Sauron matters. None of the stuff in Hobbiton matters. All that matters is saving the overall world. So Frodo is the number one main character. His arc impacts the story the most and he has to be the one to do it because without him the other hobbits would be corrupted too fast to get it to mount doom and that's why nobody else can carry that ring so your protagonist if you have a multi-pov story i write multi-pov a lot your primary number one main character is the one with the strongest arc and the one who impacts that overall theme the most they should also be unique you want to have unique characters in general, but there should be a uniqueness to your main character, like Frodo being the only one who's not easily corrupted by the ring, right? Um, something that makes this have to be their story. If you could swap them with any of the side characters, then you may not have a strong enough main character uh, because then it could be the main the side character story. Why does it have to be them? Why should we care? And then they have to be relatable. We have to believe that this person's going on this journey uh, there's even in fantasy and sci-fi and other genre fictions, we have to have a relatable character that we want to follow if we're going to keep reading the book. This is really hard to do because sometimes we want to make our character growth easier by starting them out as unlikable. But there's a difference between unlikable and unrelatable. Someone who's so aloof and so off in their own world that you can't connect with what they're doing in any way. So some questions you can ask yourself if you're developing this main character for the first time is what do they want? What do they need? What are they afraid of? And what obstacles are you going to be throwing at them that is going to shape that growth arc? 
if you answer these questions, it ties back into the ones we just talked about. It ties into the arc. It ties into what makes them relatable. It ties into why it has to be their story and be uniquely theirs. So we're going to pause here. Becca, Kevin, are there any big questions that I need to catch before I move on and pull up the builder? Well, I don't think so. We're working pretty good here. We're trying to keep up with the chat. It's going fast, but we're we're doing a good job. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. And thank you for the great questions. And I do see the villain. So there isn't always going to be a villain. Um, there can definitely be antagonists, even if they're themselves. I think Daniel did a video once about is Nemo the antagonist of his own story, right? Um, in Finding Nemo. Because the antagonist is the person that sets the biggest obstacles for the main characters. They're trying to keep them from achieving their goal. And sometimes that's us keeping ourselves from achieving the goal. Um, you see this in romances sometimes too. Sometimes there's not a bitter ex, right, Becca? <laughs> or, you know, bad mother-in-law. Sometimes it's the main character who has a past trauma and they just can't let it go. And so they self-sabotage their relationship because they can't allow themselves to move on. And in that case, they're sort of their own antagonist. Like you want this, but you're keeping yourself from getting it. And now we're going to move into the builder and talk about all the other characters that we can have beyond the main character. Side characters exist for a lot of reasons, and it would take a whole lot of slides. And I'm not going to go through all of those in slide form when we have them right there for you in Autocrate. So we're just going to pull them there. But ultimately, a side character's goal is either to guide, to encourage, to hinder, or to harm the main character. They are there to serve the storyline to a degree, but they should still be people. And that's really important. Is this main character is only a small sliver of these side characters' lives. So when you're planning your book, I highly suggest staying away from having characters who are solely there for the sake of the protagonist. Have them in the story doing whatever it is they're doing for their own reasons, because they have their own life outside of the <laughs> main character. And then it makes a richer experience when they do come across the main character. So if you've written very long or planned very long, you may know that there's a term that we call darlings, right? And a darling is something that we have spent a whole lot of time planning out only to realize that it doesn't progress our actual plot. And so it needs to be cut because in the end, the author should always know at least 100% more than the reader does. <laughs> we should always know everything. We need to know everything. And the reader doesn't need to know everything. They only need to know what is relevant to that specific scene to that specific moment of character growth, to that specific moment in the plot. So we go back to our builder and we go down to the characters section. You'll see that every single role, um, a common role is going to be available here. If you hover over these I information bubbles, you'll see what that kind of character role typically means. And some of these don't mean what you might think, right? Like an antagonist is someone who's the obstacle to the protagonist. It's someone trying to keep them from accomplishing their story goal. Someone who's trying to keep them from getting what they want. They're imposing and they're difficult. Often in genre fiction, these are the villains. However, they don't exist solely to be this, right? Every villain is a hero of their own story. So you can use this spot to give them a story. Maybe in the case of Fred and the field mouse, the chef or owner of the restaurant is the antagonist. That doesn't make him a bad guy. He wants a successful, popular restaurant, right? He doesn't want mice that bring diseases into his kitchen with his food. Now, we're in the POV of Fred the cat and the mouse, and we relate to them, and therefore we look at that owner as the antagonist, but he has his own storyline, right? So that is uh, my biggest takeaway here is take the time during your planning process to work through some of these roles and ask yourself who would fit this role in my story. Um, maybe these are roles you didn't even know you needed and some characters can do more than one thing. So for example, a relationship character is the person who tells the protagonist what they need to do. Sometimes this is the love interest. Sometimes this is the Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in the background. 
it's the person who gets the main character going like do this use the force luke let go luke um and sometimes that's the same person and coming back to romance oftentimes it's the love interest that convinces the main character to let go of their trauma and it enables them to be the best version of themselves. They don't fix the main character, but they enable them to do so. And they are also there loving them and supporting them on the side. You've got distraction characters in here. People whose entire role is to distract the protagonist, sometimes genuinely on accident. Those are some of the best ones. <laughs> like, well, Mary and Pippin are a great example <laughs> Of distraction characters they are off they're on the top of weather top and they're cooking breakfast in the middle of the night and they're about to get them all killed okay they didn't do that because they wanted to get killed they were hungry and they thought they were doing something nice and then sometimes we have distraction characters who are genuinely like sent there to distract from the actual villain so you can take this to different uh, extremes if you want to you have emotion characters who respond emotionally to the things that happen in your story versus the reason characters who represent logic and reason and working through things analytically and then you have general support characters overall so this is a nice long list of characters if you do not have someone for every single spot that is okay go ahead and write your story with who you have and then when we get to the developmental editing phase you might find that you actually had some of these roles filled by another character and it just wasn't as clear because the analyzer that we're going to touch on next week reads the book you have and tells you on the character level who it thinks fits these roles and then you know where you actually have character holes missing like characters that are missing from the story versus characters that maybe you didn't think about that way until you heard it all right and the world building section we touched on is this section right here up above it general geography flora and fauna now if you go into great detail in your premise and you tell it a specific place it will usually pull um, world building elements from those places if it's a real place but it never hurts to fact check things before you throw it in your story I've got one that's a Japanese American mythology uh, fantasy that I have, mythological fantasy in here. And it gave me Japanese names, real Japanese places, a couple cultural things that were off that I was able to fix, but it's a good springboard to get you started. Okay, how's everybody feeling right now? Feeling pretty good. Catherine, now one question that's an interesting one that hopefully won't take too long to answer. It's a, it's a doozy though, but for a regular novel, how many significant characters do you think make sense? And that really depends on the audience and the genre, correct? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really, it's a, it's a touchy topic. You might have three characters or you might have 50 if you're doing like epic fantasy or something. So it kind yeah. of depends on who your audience is and who you're trying to uh, reach. It would be desirable, I guess. And you keep in mind, too, that not every single character that you write in the book has to be named with a fully fleshed backstory. It's OK for the stable hand to just be the stable hand. It's OK for the person that they buy their loaf of bread from that morning to just be a person they bought a loaf of bread from that morning. <laughs> so when you're planning out, um, I think a bigger note here is ask yourself, what are they bringing to the character arc and the plot that nobody else I've introduced is bringing? Is this something that cannot be introduced by anybody else? If the answer is no, um, then you need that character. If this is something that an existing character already asks, then, um, or adds, then you may not need that character except as a cameo. There's lots of character questions, but I don't want to get this sidetracked because I know we could talk all day about characters, when they appear, and how many. So we're trying to do our best in answering these. All right. So it is time to outline here. I'm excited about this. Now, I'm a pantser. That does not mean I don't outline. It just means I write the book first, and then I outline. Um, it's a good idea to know how to outline, so that way you know if you have any missed 
story beats. And a story beat, again, is those plot points, the things readers expect. If they pick up an epic fantasy book, they expect a clear uh, set of things to happen. They expect there to be an inciting incident where the main character's life changes and they go off on their journey. And then they expect um, a conflict about 25% of the way in. And then they expect there to be the first meeting of the villain. And then they expect a second conflict. And then they expect a resolution at the end after a big climax, usually with a big battle, right? Those expectations vary by genre, uh, which is why having a beat sheet that is genre specific can be super, super helpful. And I'm going to go ahead and pull that up for us here. All right, so in that same builder, we looked at this a little bit already. Down at the very, very bottom, where we looked in the beginning for our outlines, is our beat sheet. In this beat sheet, in the fiction builder, you can toggle between some of the more common beats. Uh, so if you're writing a romance, there are things in romance that don't really exist in other genres as much, or it happens as a side thing, and it doesn't fall in the same place in the book. Typically, the love interest is going to meet the main character, at least in passing, very, very early on in the story for a romance. They see each other, they meet each other, um, and then there are other common expectations. There's a debate. Um, the B story breathes because there's a story of its own outside of this couple happening in the background, right? And just like for the character types, you don't have to remember what all of these beats are off the top of your head. If you're doing this for the first time, you can hover over the bubbles and it will walk you through. This is typically what would happen here. And you can plug in, if you've already started writing, plug in the beats you have now and go back in and fill in the holes. And that's what I do when I develop mental edit um, for somebody's work. I plot their work in a beat sheet and then say, hey, you're missing this beat, this beat, or this beat. If you have a book that feels too fast paced or too slow paced, like boring, typically it's because of your beats. If you have too many beats too close together where it's boom, 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 a whole lot's happening all at once, it feels fast and rushed. If you wait 300 pages between the climax and the resolution to give us their whole new life happy ending, that is a slow, slow ending. And those that difference in those two beats or the two big action points is going to make it feel like it's a boring ending. And really, it's just the pacing. The pacing is off. So you're going to go through here before you even write, if you're a planner, and just start planning out. What is my character introduction? When do they meet for the first time? How can you add those then if they're missing? The same thing for mystery or horror, a glimpse at the theme, a glimpse at the crime. You can go through and say, here's a mystery revealed and work through the one that works best. Now, if yours is not genre fiction and you do write fiction, you are going to probably write one of two story types, plot-centered or character-centered stories. Character-centered stories are stories that are about the main character's growth. That is the number one focus of the story, the main character's journey. Think The Hunger Games. Katniss Everdeen growing as a person, and I mean the books here, not the movies. Katniss Everdeen's growth from an innocent child who thinks she's very mature and that she knows everything about the world to a woman who has seen what the world actually is, is the front and center focus of the story. And the plot drives that growth, but we're in her head. It's a first person POV. It's a very deep POV. Details like the game master stuff in the Capitol, like they have in the movies, none of that's there. So it's more important that we see the events that shape her into who she becomes versus a plot-centered story. And a plot-centered story is going to focus on an amazing plot, some creative twists, achieving a specific story goal, and the character growth happens alongside. So where is the focus of your narrator going to be? Is the narrator going to be tuned into a character and how they're changing and the plot that gets them there is the side note? Or is the narrator going to be focused on the plot, and then the character growth happens as a side note. Um, some plot-centered genres are going to be your actions, your thrillers, sometimes the suspense, uh, easily fall into plot-centered books. So neither one 
is a bad choice. It just goes to which story you're wanting to deliver to your readers. Now, if you've already started writing, um, and we did mention this um, already, I did a video that you can find on the Autocrit uh, YouTube page about reverse outlining. This is a one hour long video that goes through the process of taking a book you've already written and reverse outlining it in order to be ready for developmental editing, which is what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, breaking it down and making sure we don't have plot holes and that we have strong character arcs and that our world building is immersive and all of those elements that fall into developmental editing um, it comes from establishing what you already have to start. So if you want to hop on over to the Autocrit YouTube, you can definitely check that out for my fellow pantsers. Um, and if you don't know our link or have our link, this little help bubble in the bottom right hand corner of the Autocrit site will take you right there. Uh, you can just tell us, hey, I need the link to the reverse planning video and we'll drop it for you. Um, but that'll be down here in the bottom right. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to writing and we're going to finish out today's lesson with the good part. We've done our brainstorming. We know what our story's about. We are going to flesh out between now and when we start actually drafting all of the beats and the characters and the world, but then it's time to start putting the pen to paper. And Autocrit's got a bunch of tools that can help you do that. If you don't use Autocrit, then make note, so that way you can go and do some of these things on your own. You need a word processor. Autocrit has a great tool that I have been using to write all of my recent books, and that is voice-to-text dictation. So because Autocrit's web-based, and it doesn't have app restrictions, I can open Autocrit on Google Chrome on my phone. And I turn it landscape, and I open the file, I put the cursor at the end of what I'm writing, and then I literally click the dictate button and click record. And it will write my book as I talk. That's hard for it to pick up while I'm on Zoom too, but... Um, so it'll write it there in your file and you don't have to give it punctuation. <laughs> you just have to speak clearly, speak loudly, uh, watch for background noise. I have two toddlers. So most of my writing is done when I'm driving in and out of town. I live about an hour out of a major city. So it gives me an hour to write. And in that hour, I can usually write a good 1200 words or so just by telling the app the story. And then I'm done for the day. Um, you can also manually type in here if you wish. And if you saved any of your ideas as notes, you can open your note board here and you'll have access to a note there. So for example, open in the pizzeria. And then I can start writing based on where that note was, right? So I want to open in the pizzeria. So in the pizzeria, this is not a good first sentence. Don't copy this. <laughs> the pizzeria. Fred the cat did X, Y, Z. And you can type in here as well. If you like accountability, we have ways for you to get this accountability for your writing process, both by yourself and in the group. So I recommend, and I know Becca has used this to sprinting. Sprinting is a good way to push yourself. It's basically giving yourself an allotted amount of time to do nothing but write, to ignore the rest of the outside world. You have permission for 15 minutes to just write. And then you can take a break and address social media or the phone or the kids or the husband, right? But the rest of the time, you can actually just focus on writing, giving yourself permission. You can set up those timers by clicking on the timer settings button here and either turn on sprints, which is what I use. I say, hey, I'm going to um, sprint for 15 minutes and then it'll time me. You can see it puts 15 minutes up here on the timer and I hit the start and it'll buzz me when I'm done. Or you can do, I know Becca loves Pomodoros. And I think you said 20 minutes is your sweet spot, right? I do 20 minutes on, three minutes off and I try to do um, five Pomodoros in a row. In a row. So yeah, we got three minutes. You can have it count up or count down depending on what your preference is. 
if you like the emojis, I have a love-hate relationship with the emojis in this system because it makes me feel very guilty to have them turned on. And then at the same time, it's like, well, watching the sad smiley face at the top might just give you the kick that you need to write. Uh, but basically, you can tell it to give me positive reinforcement. I want to try to write 35 words a minute or 70 words a minute or whatever you want to write. And then if I go more than X amount of time, in this case, I have mine set to 30 seconds. If I go more than 30 seconds without writing anything, I want to sad him. I want to sad him at me. <laughs> so you can change those times to whatever you would like them to be, uh, whatever works best for you. You can also track your daily goals in Autocrit. You can track your word count added. You can turn that off or on. Uh, so you can really customize this to whatever you'd like. My daily goal is a thousand words. As I said earlier, some people like to do 200 words, which is about a standard page, like print page. Some people like to do longer. It's really whatever works best for you. But all of those things will be available here for you in Autocrit. And if you want to track your trends over time, there's an entire goals and stats section of Autocrit that you can click on. Um, and this will chart your goals and your word count by whatever date range. So from this date to this date, August 31st to September 7th, writing 3,000 words a day. And it'll tell you how many days you've written in the system. Here's my streak. Here's how many words I have left to do to achieve this this, this, all the way up. And then you can also track how much you got per day on a on a growing basis. So these are all different things in here to keep you sort of motivated on your own. Now, if you like group motivation, Autocrit's got that too. This is, I believe, the last thing I've got to really show us. And then we'll answer any questions for anybody that has them. So this group uh, style accountability that we have for our pro members is available multiple times every month. Every single week we have accountability club, which is where we check in on stats. Uh, it's where we do writing sprints together. And then Becca is leading a midnight sprint. And then Becca is also doing sprinting power hour with those Pomodoros, I believe. Um, and so uh, accountability club is every single week. It alternates between a late night and a morning session. So come tune in with us and we have a whole sprinting thread in the forum, as well as a daily check-in thread where you can post how many words you're aiming for that day, answer a prompt if your brain's not wanting to kick into writing gear that day as well. And I do want to just encourage everybody that the time it takes to plan and write a book varies by person. Okay, there are those of us who spent years writing our first book. And then after the first book was done and we had an idea of what we were doing, it just picked up super fast. We were able to crank out books. Becca cranks out 200,000 words a month. The more you do it, like any craft, like any art, writing it gets better. So hopefully the Autocrit tools that you saw today and the processes you saw today will help you get into planning and writing your book again. Um, and hopefully not take you years, right? I think most of our members now are getting, I'm just so encouraged to see people finishing their books and talking about it in the community. So we want to be here the whole step of the way. And next week, we're going to come back and do developmental editing, and that's going to start the post process. So this is going to be editing for plot, pacing, world building, character development, POV, and things like that. That is on the calendar. Um, and I do have a link for that. So let me go ahead and grab it. And while I'm grabbing that link, if anybody wants to let me know, uh, Kevin or Becca, if there's any big questions that I've missed, we're going to extend because so many people tuned, turned in today, tuned in today. So excited. So many of you guys are here. We want to make sure we've given your questions their due diligence. So if you have an extra few minutes, to stay on. We'll be happy to answer any questions we didn't get. No, and you absolutely, okay, developmental editing is best done on um, at least a first chapter. If you have a first chapter, that might be a good place to try dev editing for the first time. 
because then it lets you know if you're on track with what you need to be doing for the rest of your book. Um, but don't feel like you have to crank out an entire novel between now and next Saturday by any means. <laughs> We're going to be going through all of these steps, uh, but then we'll leave the replays up so that you can come back to them anytime. And yeah, everybody has a formula that works best for you. So we definitely want to be here to help um, improve that process and hopefully save you some time because it can be a lot of time. Someone asked for the slides. Which slide was it? Oh, the immediate world building slide. Forgive me as I fly back through here. Here we go, the immediate world building slide. Lots of great comments. I know the chat. The Sorry, Catherine, I know the chat is moving super fast, so we're trying to get to that, but I did just drop that $15 um, offer if you want to try some of these pro tools out and see how it works for you. I just dropped that in the chat um, for people to check that out. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yes, you can upgrade to Lifetime anytime um, while this, if you get the $15 and you decide, hey, I'm I'm done, I want this for my books, and you wanna do lifetime, then message our support team and we'll get you changed over. Absolutely. Um, an interview with a vampire, this is highly controversial because Lestat comes across different ways to different people. I'm gonna speak to the book because I've not watched a whole lot of the movie. Um, in the book version of Interview with the Vampire, I would put Lestat as um, sort of a distraction character, really. I know there are some people who feel like he's the villain. I personally put him in distraction character because Louis was always sort of on a path for self-destruction by his own admittance. And Lestat doesn't get in the way of Louis wanting a different life. If anything, he gave him the different life. Uh, so I don't think of him as a positive, <laughs> a positive member of Louis's life, but yeah, sort of that distraction from what he might actually be supposed to be doing. Um. So Autocrit is 100% web-based. These gener generating tools for the ideas and stuff, it has to have an internet connection to work. Now you can absolutely write offline if you want and then um, bring your work that you wrote offline into Autocrit. You can upload it, you can copy and paste it. So if you don't want to do your actual writing sitting there on the internet, that's okay. Um, you just upload the file as a docx or whatever works best for you. But in order to do the builder tools, you'll need the internet. And you, there's not a phone app, but the good news about not having a phone app means no restrictions <laughs> based on the type of phone you're using. So I use Google Chrome, like I said, on my phone, um, and then just turn it landscape and it works like a charm. And it should not lose your word count. Now the word count um, updates, I believe daily, for the words added today. The overall word count should stay there. Now I'm going to say, if you're using Autocrit, please only have the book open in a single tab on a single device. If you have it open on multiple tabs or on your phone and your computer at the same time, then the auto saves that go every few minutes could overwrite your work and you could end up potentially losing work because it's saving over each other. There are safeguards in place to try to help you recover versions of your work, but I would rather just not ever have to go there. So when you're done with Autocrit on one device, just log out, put it on the other device and write. Uh, the other reason too you wanna do that is we've been rolling out so many updates lately that logging out and then back in lets the new updates load. Um, so you have all the new tools, like the new deep POV tool someone mentioned in the chat. We're gonna be speaking to that um, come back to office hours on Tuesday. We're going to be speaking to that a little bit then. little sneak preview here. 
Um, and Rachel, love the question about the beat sheet from the completed manuscript. Absolutely. We are going to open next week's dev editing with that. So come back for that. Yeah, thank you all so much for the questions. If I've missed anything, Kevin or Becca, let me know, or you guys can drop it again at the very bottom. Yes, and if we didn't catch you uh, in your questions, because I know it's going kind of fast and furious in the chat, feel free to reach out to us anytime using the little chat bubble on any of the Autocrit pages. Just say, hey, I have this question. We're always happy to help. Uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Yeah. That's what we love to do here. Right, that's the whole Absolutely. point of us being here is to help you. And yes, for those who join late, we will absolutely be posting a replay for sure. Yes. Um, pro members, so your pro membership gives you access to the full suite, everything in the writer's desk, the planning tools, the writing tools, the editing tools, the formatting tools, it's all included. Um, and then the pro membership also includes those pro member events like the clubs I just showed you that we do every week and access to the pro community forums as well. So you're getting a whole community. All right. I need duct tape so I can't leave my desk. <laughs> oh, and just so you know too, right, right, Catherine, we're not only doing these one-on-one sessions, we also have open office sessions on occasion as well. So uh, keep your questions always handy. Yeah, and Nancy, I'm from the South. I'm from Memphis uh, originally. I saw your note about Southern accents. The dictation does work pretty well, but I would keep certain lingo. I'd go back and look to fix later, right? So I've written characters that have a more pronounced accent than I'm told I speak with these days. Um, I go in and just touch it up. So if you have a character that has a unique manner of speaking. Once you finish doing the majority of the dictation, start at the top, scroll down, and you're just touching up here and there. But for the most part, it seems to do pretty well. But if you can reduce any background, like if you don't have music on, you don't have a TV on, it'll pick up a whole lot clearer than if you have, like when my toddlers are running through the other room, there will be random in a scene where I didn't necessarily want them. Um, so just keep that in mind too yeah the dictations it's game changing when you're busy on the go okay well I think um, I see the question about autocrit when you export to word so however the document looks in autocrit on the screen is how it will look when you export it to Word. Now we have added formatting tools. So you can format it for publication in the site now um, and generate an EPUB. It's got a table of contents in it. It's got the copyright page in it. It's got everything. It's just fantastic, honestly. I've started using it and I'm really excited about it. Um, and it also has that print ready PDF that has the Dinkus icons in it and everything. So that way you can just upload it. Um, but I would not put a whole lot of time into formatting your book until you're completely done writing it and editing it if you can. Uh, just because if you end up like me, chopping off your entire ending on almost every single book and rewriting the last 3,000 words, you've wasted all the time to format it and get your widows and orphans on the pages where there's one random word floating on the top of the page or something fixed only to redo the whole thing. <laughs> so um, I suggest waiting, get it all done and then do the format if you can, yeah. And this is something of course, we're always working on improving, right? Uh, so keep keep posted, keep keep letting us know the troubles you have. And then if, if we don't know about it, we can't fix it. So by all means, keep reaching out to us and letting us know. Uh, if you have any troubles and we're always uh, happy to work it out and or enhance the system. Uh, if you struggle with where the story should begin, I would say just start writing a scene that really has your attention to start. If you're struggling just to write somewhere. Now, if you've already started writing scenes and you don't know where to start the story at, uh, most genres are going to want to start with a glimpse of life before things changed. 
that doesn't mean it has to be that way. Some genres are not. If you're writing action, most action books start with an action scene. If you're writing romance, most books start with a pretty quick run into the meet cute where the couple meets for the first time. And then we follow Susie home and meet her cute Pomeranian, okay? Then we see her life after that. Um, but fantasy, sci-fi, we're probably going to be getting a glimpse of what their life is before their whole world turns upside down. Mystery, we're getting a little bit of that, but you're also setting up the mystery in the first chapter, first and foremost. So I would go to that beat sheet and put, look at whatever genre you chose if you're writing genre uh, or choose the plot or character centered and look at what it suggests as putting in that first beat and try that. You can always shift it around. If you end up not liking that being where it is, you can drag and drop a chapter in Ottergrit too, which we'll talk about next week and be like, this should be my first chapter. I'm going to just drag it up here and blob it down in the first chapter spot. The export to EPUB only for pro, yes. Yeah. And also as a reminder, and I posted it in the chat, is that we do offer um, for people who want to really pro uh, troubleshoot your story or really talk about it one-on-one -on -one in a coaching session, we do offer the Story Doctor Clinic and you can book that at, at pretty much um, any time. So you, I dropped that link in there and you can check it out and you can grab one of our editing staff and sit down and we will work on your story with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we do have an entire beat sheet specifically for um, short stories. So let me pull that up real fast before we hop off. For all my short story people, we got you. <laughs> Here we go. So here's our dev editing. I'm go back to the writer's desk and open up a file. I had a good bit of fun doing my flash fiction for the New York City Midnight Challenge in here. Oh, so go to your builder, go down to your outline section, and then under here, you're going to change this to short story. Even short stories have expected beats. There should still be a very clear beginning, middle, and end. You just have less words to get there. Um, and so some of the beats are more truncated, and this short story version really helps you know which ones matter enough to give page time. When you're only working with a thousand words or when you're only working with five thousand words versus what it could be if you fleshed out the entire thing right so still have a resolution still have your opening image and things like that uh, if you already have work in autocrit and then drop a chapter that you did offline does it count the additional words yes so if you have a file See, if I go into here, one of the ones I'm writing, and I go to the very end of the file and say, oh, I found this chapter, and I need to add the chapter, you're going to click at the end of the file, and then you're going to click the import button, and either choose the file from elsewhere in Autogrid if you're just combining them, or click upload and select the file. It will add that file to this document, and it will update your total word count. Now, it won't count it as words you wrote in the system that day because you didn't write them in the system. Uh, you have to actually type or use the dictation and write in the system itself for it to track your words added today as words you added in Autocrit today. Um, but the total words will update. And for that word count differentiation, um, it is going to count the actual number of words you have. So different documents count words different. Microsoft Word, I believe, takes the total number of characters, not just letters, but like spaces and everything, and divides it by five. And that's the estimated word count it gives you. Autocrit is here is the actual number you have. So you may see a difference in number in Autocrit. So if you're using Autocrit and then you plan to submit a piece and they have a word count limit, check where they are doing their word count. Like contest will say, we're going to take the word count from Word. We're going to take it from Google Docs. Let that be the word count, export it out to Word, and then go um, from there. But uh, within within that system, the, I know the copy and pasting came up there, Catherine. If you do copy and paste your work in, 
you would just want to track not the words added, but track the file word count. And then you can also track your overall word count in the system. So you just kind of looking at a different number because clearly we want to try to keep people honest when they actually type in the words and not copy and paste and things, things like that. Otherwise, it would be pretty annoying if every time you copied and pasted in your whole book, you wrote somewhere else, you had 80,000 words. You didn't really write 80,000 words of that day. So that's mm -hmm. what we're kind of trying to keep track of how, much, how many words you write every day. So it's yeah. kind of a, I know it's a trade off, but. Yeah. Yeah, no, no cheating for daily workouts. <laughs> it's true, um, it's so true. It's like, are... it's like what is putting duct tape on your refrigerator, right? When you're on a diet, it's the same idea. And for the authors, so the comparisons for authors doesn't really affect any of the planning tools that we talked about today. You can choose authors to select for the editing tools, which we're going to get into over the next four weeks. Um, so people know that I like to write in George R. R. Martin's style, but I like the pace of Sanderson. I want my books to be faster paced than Martin delivers. No offense to Martin if he ever sees this. So I run my books through George R. R. Martin on technical editing. How many adverbs I have, how long, or how many... Uh, how much dialogue I have in a book versus POV that's from a narrator, things like that. I run against Martin for comparison. Um, and then I change it to Sanderson to run my pacing reports. And then I fix it <laughs> based on that. Um, none of those comparative tools, though, affect your planning. So if you change it to Martin and then you go into the builder, it's not going to use Martin's work to suggest content for you. So <laughs> it's going to take your premise to give you ideas. Um, that's not going to be related to the author. And same thing for the analyzer next week in developmental editing. It's going to read your book and give feedback based on your book. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, I think we're about caught up. Is there anything that stands out that I missed? We're all good, Catherine. I really had fun this, uh, this session. This was great. Yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Super excited. Yes. Glad to see so many people writing. Your and current project has two styles and voices. Is this going to be workable? Absolutely. Um, I've got a book that I'm doing right now where one POV is first person present tense and one is third person past tense, which I don't recommend, by the way. I'm finishing a series that I already published two of three books. And so I have to finish the third book in that, that style. Um, it does work. <laughs> you just have to, when you're doing your tense report, that's the only place is, yes, this character is supposed to have the past tense. This character is supposed to be the present tense. But yeah. You're torturing yourself, Catherine. I know. Got to be consistent. <laughs> Whatever you start, <laughs> if you publish a certain number of books for readers, you have to finish the series out. It would be so weird to be like, I've been writing all of these like this, and now you're getting a third person past sense, the whole book. Congratulations. <laughs> just all right, everybody. Um, I would say just a reminder that if you need that encouragement, if you need to interact with us, come on over to community. Catherine and I pretty much live over there. I am answering things at like one in the morning because as a writer, I never sleep. I'm sure <laughs> Um, so come, come hang out with us. We have so many different forums. We have, I just started one for neurodivergent writers. We've got all kinds of different genre things like come say hi. And we're here to hype you up. Um, I am great at being a cheerleader. If you want to message me and say, I'm feeling bad about this, but I need to do it. I'm going to hype you up. So join community and, uh, come say hi to us. Yes. Yep. Looking forward to seeing everybody around. I'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody.